But let's, let's read again what we might have forgotten. It's been two weeks. So I want to start at the top of the chapter, and I want to read through uh, where I hope to get tonight. And a little bit of this will be redundant just for the first couple of minutes because we read it uh, two weeks ago. My brethren, chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. I, I, I must read that to you as it appears in the Greek because it's different, if you'll remember. My brethren, you do not hold the faith of Jesus when you judge on external appearance. That is a powerful verse. You are not holding the faith that our Lord Jesus had when you judge people on their external appearance. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy or vile clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality, or the Greek, have you not differentiated among yourselves? You made a judgment call. What was that judgment call based upon? It was based upon the appearance. James says, you've become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Guys, this is an unfair statement. I'm sorry, James asked an unfair question. No, God did not choose the poor of the world to inherit the kingdom. God chose whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved to inherit the kingdom. God, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Not all the poor people, but not very many rich people. James has an, a, an issue in his heart here. Let's just, again, I think it's okay to call it what it is and realize the, the workings through of the writer. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Eh, probably. Do, does every rich person oppress you and drag you into court? No. He's painting with an awfully broad brush here, wouldn't you say? There's a little truth to this, but don't take this as a gospel statement. And by gospel, I mean good news. Okay? He's not trying to proclaim the gospel here. He's trying to clean up a pattern, and he's got a little prejudice involved in his pattern. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? Well, certainly there are probably some rich people in James's day that did, but we also know according to Paul's journey, there's some very wealthy people that did not blaspheme the name of God and drag people into court. But now we get into the meat. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you'll do well. The word royal there in the Greek is the equivalent of a kingdom ruled by a king. And this is where we get the subtitle tonight, the kingdom law, because James says if you really fulfill the kingdom law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, then you do well. Love your neighbor as yourself is the bedrock of... Jesus is teaching on love. It's the bedrock of Paul's culmination of love in Romans. Uh, it's found in Leviticus 18. It's a, it's a core tenet of the Mosaic economy was to love your neighbor as yourself. We'll, we're going to deal with this uh, within its context in a moment. Let's keep reading. But if you show partiality, okay, we're not off that subject yet, obviously. You commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever, and we're going to deal with that, extensively. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. In other words, you don't get to pick and choose. If you're going to live underneath the Mosaic law, you're going to live underneath the entire Mosaic law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty, for judgment is without mercy for the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I know we skipped some stuff there. I really just wanted to frame it, get it to where I, I hope we can arrive, and then we'll walk through some of this, this um, pretty important material as we go. I want to start with this statement, and this is going to set the heartbeat for this passage on judgment tonight, because this deals with judgment and how we judge and how we are judged and how we respond and how we are responded to. And the statement is this, there is no basis for judgment under the new covenant. Since Christ has been judged on our behalf and has freed us from the curse of the law, there is no basis for you to judge your neighbor. What would be the basis? 
If Christ has been judged on your neighbor's behalf, what does your neighbor have left for you to judge them by? James opens the chapter by saying, you don't have the faith of Christ if you judge your neighbor by what they look like or by what you see, by partiality. I'll take it a step further. You don't have the faith of Christ if you're judging what has already been judged. Because Christ was all about finishing the work that His Father gave Him to do. The reason why, now it was just a big blanket statement, but let's qualify it. The reason why there's no basis for judgment in the New Covenant is because in order to judge someone, you must put both them and yourself under the law. Because what is the basis for you to judge them other than they do this or they did that? And so in order to do that, you must place yourself under the law. I, I've said this before with forgiveness. I want to repeat it tonight. If you have an unforgiveness problem, you're a legalist. This is hard for grace people to swallow because they don't think they're legalistic on anything. And yet they have a forgiveness issue. They can't forgive their kids. They can't forgive their parents. They can't forgive their coworker. They can't forgive their enemy. They can't forgive this person in their past. And they go, well, I'm full of grace. No, if you have a forgiveness issue, you're a legalist. Because what is the grounds by which you refuse to forgive them? Performance. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. Okay, so you are not forgiving them based upon their performance. Tell me you're not a legalist. Tell me that in that situation in your life, legalism is not ruling how you treat your neighbor. Because legalistically, you're not allowed to forgive them because they broke the law that you had established. I don't care what the law is. It doesn't even matter what they did to you. That's not the important part of the legalistic. The law never asked you what you thought about it. It just told you not to do it. And so if someone in your life cannot receive the forgiveness that is yours to give, it's yours to give, it's not, no one makes you, but it's yours to give. So if you refuse to give it, why are you refusing to give it? Because they don't deserve it, because they hurt me, because they did this, because they've done that, because they won't do this, because they won't say that, because they haven't done this. Every answer you're going to give is based on performance and not based on grace. How are you not a legalist? Oh, it's a hard pill to swallow, man. I, believe me, I've had to swallow it. It's, it goes down sideways and it chokes and you can't breathe. And you're going, God, I didn't think there's any legalism in my life. How can I not get over this? So you're going to have to receive from me, son, forgiveness you cannot earn or you're never going to be able to give out forgiveness that, you cannot, that cannot be earned. And when I get in an issue where I'm having trouble forgiving, it, what he's revealing to me is there's an area in my life that I'm having trouble receiving his forgiveness. And all I do usually is do a little inventory and I'll realize I've started adding some dead works to my Christianity to make up for feelings or emotions or condemnations. And I have to go, Father, I receive your, your forgiveness for me. The, the, I, I'm not going to do this anymore out of a sense of obligation. And you know what I found? As I do that, man, it becomes easy to lay down the shackles of unforgiveness because I'm the only one suffering when I don't forgive. The person you don't forgive couldn't care less. You're the one suffering. Why would you place yourself under bondage? You don't have to be under bondage. And so I say, Father, I'm free from the shackles of lack of forgiveness. And I just receive your forgiveness for me, and I believe that that allows me to be a forgiving of someone else.